turned off the light so people couldn't see what's playing. And then we're asked, oh, what is it, the artist or the phonograph? And it's reported people couldn't distinguish, which is very odd uh, if we look at it from what we today think is necessary to have really perfect sound reconstruction. Anyway, could we do that today? Probably in some circumstances, yes. But if it's one sound source and we have a loudspeaker, a good loudspeaker sitting there and then on the other hand, the artists. But once we have a jazz combo playing or classic orchestra or whatever, it wouldn't really work. So, and especially if we try to do the same with headphone reconstruction, it wouldn't really work. We couldn't, uh, we could easily, if we are in the room and we have open headphones, we could distinguish whether it's the headphones or it's the source in front of us where we listen to. But that's really the old dream. So to understand what can work and what not, uh, how uh, that can really work out in the end. Uh, let me introduce uh, one slide from my old friend, Jim Johnston. And I like it very much because that really shows what happens when we are listening to sound. So we have the ear, we have the inner ear, which already performs a lot of signal processing, so to speak. Uh, what we call masking is really happening in the inner ear. And then it goes to brain. Uh, we get feature analysis, audio object analysis, and so on. But it's very important is that it's not a one-way street. We get feedback. We get what we think we hear, our surroundings, and so on. Everything is influencing uh, the auditory object analysis, the feature analysis, and so on. Even in some some instances, the ears, the reflexes, which change the way we are listening. So that's important to know because that means uh, whenever we listen, it's an interaction between the outside sound, the ear, and the brain, and it's not the runway street. Okay, so what we want is immersive sound via headphones. For loudspeakers, we get great sounds, and there have been new technologies uh, like wavefield synthesis, virtual-based amplitude panning, uh, ambisonics, and so on, which really give us a great sound in a room to the point where people really can think there are somewhere else with some restrictions, but it works quite well. If you just have our normal headphones on, and all of you know this, the sound comes first of all from within our head. Or if it's a bit better, we still often get front back confusion and anyway, it doesn't feel real. And we'll get into more details of why this is the case in a moment. Uh, what you know, of course, is we got the sound getting to our ears, being filtered differently from our pinna, outer ears, cochlea, and so on. Uh, all the buildup uh, of our head and torso. And that means it's filtered differently depending on the direction we are looking. And that means whenever I turn my head, I have different sound coming in. Our brain knows that and translates that to direction. So that on one hand means even with one ear, we can have some feeling of direction. On the other hand, if we have headphones on and we turn the head, the sound stays the same. What's the only place the sound can come from if I turn my head and it's the same? It's really from within the head. So that's a very simple explanation for that. 
And to get around this, there has been lots of research in the last decades. So what can be done? Uh, first big attempt on that was that, of course, with traditional two-channel stereo, we just have an intensity of sound, uh, the mono-compatible sound, as we hear it from FM radio. In fact, it's just intensities, not even time differences. So the next thing was, okay, let's transmit the sound like it would be coming to our ears. So for that, use an artificial head, Keemer or whatever the brand is. And that way, retain the time and phase relationship and at least listen via this artificial head, which is similar to human head. Which 40 years or 45 years when it was uh, uh, done a lot, including some broadcasting with this and so on, uh, dummy head recordings uh, worked nicely in some cases, and you could have somebody whisper into your ear and it sounded real. But then you still got front back confusion uh, and you, if you wanted to listen to something happening in front of you and in all directions, it broke down. So it didn't really work. Next idea was, okay, let's not use uh, just the dummy head had related transfer function, but uh, use uh, individual HRTFs. So measure these at the entrance, at the eardrum, or the entrance to the ear canal, different versions which have been lost there, which works already better. But still, if you turn your head, you find out soon that it's wrong. Next idea. And that's technology of the late 80s. I think, I think it was in 1990 or so when I first got a demo of that. Uh, remember, some of you will remember the Convolvotron was to have some device measuring which direction you look and then uh, use that to do a real-time calculation of interpolated head-related head transfer functions depending on how you turn your head, which at that time was very difficult because just to calculate the filters in real-time uh, needed fast signal processors uh, for that time, array of signal processors, but already, again, an improvement but still not always working. Uh, and in fact, there were some demos of these techniques which worked great. This was especially the case if you had a setup uh, with where you saw some loudspeakers and you got the sound, uh, you got a different sound if you turned the head and it was done in the same room where the microphone was. So I remember one demo where there was a piano and microphones and you had uh, your headphones on and it sounded very realistic. But in other cases, it didn't sound that realistic. So still some problems. So the next idea was, okay, let's introduce room simulation. Let's not just take some music as recorded, but simulate a room where you are doing the listening. Again, an improvement. And then, and that's the currently, from my point of view, best commercial system doing this, uh, you include a little bit of training. So you have your headphone and you first have to find out, okay, which loudspeaker is playing and is the amplitude correct and so on. So you do an adaptation of the system to your actual ears, which is the best in the moment, but still does not work in all the cases. So what's wrong? What's wrong is that we underestimate what our brain is really doing. And I want to 
uh, quote uh, Dörte Hammershoy in last year's AES conference on headphone technology, where I said, this is not a verbal quote, but uh, she, she said something like, oh, look, our brain really is a very, very good pattern matches, listening all the time and matches what it listens to all the stored patterns of what it has heard before. So it actually compares the input to earlier input. And depending on how good the match is, we get a more convincing or not so convincing illusion. And in fact, there's a lot of demos which showing that this comparing to what is known and what we know uh, really makes a lot of difference in listening. Of course, there's ventriloquism. So you have the feeling that the puppet is speaking even if that can't speak, but it's the person next to it, which tries not to move the mouse and the puppet mouse is moving. You have the McGurk effect. I assume all of you know this. Uh, you hear a figure, some head uh, pronouncing some syllables and whether you close your eyes or have your eyes open, you hear, hear something different because it's really what you see doesn't match what you hear and your brain tries to adapt these things. And then, and we'll get to that later as well, you can be trained to listen with somebody else's ears. All that proves that these cognitive effects are very important. So what we need if we want really a plausible spatial auditory illusion is a match between expectation of a given sound in a given environment. And that includes cues for our own anatomy, that's the HRTF thing, cues for the room, reflection patterns, all that, visual cues, our sense of our bodies if we move, so that's the proprioception, and our experience, what we've heard before. So next chapter, what is really the goal? What do we want to reach? It's easy to say we want perfect auditory illusion, but what to compare to? What is really the goal there? In fact, there are two possibilities. We can say we want to have the rendering of the sound in a way that it's closest to reality, which gives us a problem in testing that we have to find a way to compare to reality, which in most cases we can't. Or do we just want the perceptually preferred renderer? This might not be the same. And if a reference is required, we have to be careful. It's, this is really need to be chosen for the goal of the investigation and it's relevant for all different test methods. So for that, other people have introduced uh, the ideas of authenticity and plausibility. Authenticity is really the agreement with an external reference to start with. And that's what we test for in audio coding. That's what we did in MP3 development times. We had the real signals, we had the coded signals, and both should be so close that in a double blind test, you couldn't distinguish. So the same we want in spatial hearing, but that needs a reference, which we don't have usually. And there's the idea of plausibility, which we can translate into agreement with an internal reference, or it means it sounds like it should sound even if we don't have anything to compare to. Of course, if we don't have anything to compare to, what then? Fictive contents. So rooms in a virtual world, which are artificial. Fictive VR scenes, like uh, we got in the MPEG-I standardization effort nowadays. So, the question is how to test that and what to go for. 
And if we look at plausibility, that's in most cases the only thing we really can test for if we have a VR or AR system. It's still the question, is it tuned to something real or is it a pure inner reference? And there have been a lot of different experiments and publications on that. You see some of the references. And uh, if you do it with a real reference, it clearly influences the possibility ratings. I think that's a matter of fact thing. Uh, even in a single stimulus tests. So if you don't can, can't switch back and forth, but have this or that. If you have to compare to the inner reference, uh, you got into more problems. It's individually different. It can be inaccurate or wrong. And the listener might not even have a remembering of the situations. So in some other experiments, there was a question, can it still be tested? What is plausibility without reference? We got the same problems again. And in actual observations in experiments, like walking towards a virtual sound source, uh, interesting enough, sometimes there was a stronger level change preferred, even if that was not what happens in reality. So here we have first the effect of so-called hyperrealism, which means uh, it sounds more realistic, but it isn't in reality. And on the other hand, sim similar effect, if we look to the binary room impulse responses, uh, interpolated versions have been preferred to the real versions sometimes. Again, the reality is not as smooth as expected. So let's look once more at this inner reference. And that's just a figure which is similar to a lot of other figures done by different people in the field. And we have on one hand uh, quality elements, we have parameters, and we have a quality of a system, a technical quality. And then we got the perceived quality and the expected quality. And these influence each other. There's assimilation and accommodation. And together that gives a quality of experience and we can try to measure that via subjective tests. So assimilation is existing schemes are fitted to the current perception. Accommodation means there's something new which is learned and this is a scheme which is created internally because old schemes cannot be fitted to the current perception. So the difference is too big. And all these schemes are really in the end the basis of our quality judgment. Okay, there are more factors for that. So there are sensory conditions, cognitive load. If you have to look to too many different things going on, it's difficult to really find the quality measure for that. The motivation, do I want to do this test? Task awareness, uh, whether it's too late in the night and so on and so on. Okay, let's go on to some other effects which have been studied long time ago and over and over again. And here we have the first time there will be more uh, talking about that later on with, and when I rem uh, talk more about our research in Ilmen now, uh, the question of how do we learn? How does what we hear change with time? How does what we've heard before influence how we feel the sound is realistic or not and so on? And there's been a lot of research over time starting with, for example, putting molds to your ear. So your outer ear in terms of acoustics behaves differently. <laughs> and uh, for trackies, uh, this is like Mr. Spock has different hearing than other people. And this is known to first uh, affect the up and down recognition. 
so these spinal ear molds change listening, but if you have them on long enough, then everything goes back to normal. You can have the same uh, really listening and the same uh, recognizing up and down and all that. Uh, in fact, that way, and that's been, there have been many more experiments over the time, it's proven that you can learn to listen with somebody else's ears. And what's interesting is you don't forget your own ears. The adaptation in this case can be quite fast, but still, uh, if the mold is detached from your ear, you are very soon back to normal hearing. There's no change. So that's known for a long time, but concrete models are still not available. So it would be nice to know more about that, but we know that it is there, but that's basically it. Okay, just going on to the spatial auditory illusions. There's some early work. Uh, there's some references from Floyd Toole in 1970, from Professor Plenge in 1972. Uh, Plenge studied in head localization. In fact, that can even occur outside the world if you don't have headphones on. And he already said, okay, there are some cognitive effects. This has to be with ex something to do with expectations. And Floyd Toole in 1984 summarized physical and acoustical differences in ears may explain some of the problems, but it seems likely that there is a higher order psychoacoustical factor, the listener experience and expectations. And that's really what even while Floyd Toole already mentioned that, people have been missing over several decades that if we have the same signal at the eardrum, do everything right in the physical way, but we got different expectations in people, the sound, it will sound differently. So that's really the big thing. And that's in fact, something which is, was known from anecdotal evidence uh, for myself from many decades ago as well. And some 10 years ago, we said, okay, let's go and find out what's really happening there. And that's already going to our research over the last decade in Ilmenau with looking at some of these effects and what we found, what we found in fact now has been duplicated by other labs. Uh, we've not always been the first ones, of course, to do that, but there's been, is now a lot of uh, agreement in the scientific community on these. First is what we call room divergence. And for that, uh, if you are in a different room, there's two things which could be different. On one hand, the audio auditory visual divergence, like in the ventriloquism effect. So the room looks different, but even if you don't see anything, if you are blinded, there's an acoustic divergence that's your brain remembers where you've been last, remembers different types of room. And if there's something not fitting, then you go back to front back confusion and so on and so on. In fact, that's the uh, overriding rule for all of that. We get a lot of cues into our brain. And if there's too much divergence in some of these cues, then the acoustic illusion can't happen anymore. So this is already quite some years ago. In fact, this figure is from 2016, but the research was done a few years earlier. Uh, Stefan Werner is the one who did his PhD on this topic. Uh, an experiment uh, using on one hand uh, 
for the simulation, all that was done over headphones, uh, impulse responses, HRTF or binary room impulse responses in the free field or different types of rooms. FF is free field. This is just the anchor. So no, that doesn't really work in terms of uh, having externalization. Uh, then we got our listening lab, HL here. In other slides, it will be called LL listening labs. That's a relatively dry room according to ITU 1116 uh, recommendation for listening rooms. And the other one is a seminar room with all the acoustic problems of a seminar room. Um, oh, first I should, of course, explain what we are looking for. Uh, we are asking people for externalization, which for me means, is the sound near the head or is it really far away at the point where I think it should be? Of course, subjectively. So perfectly externalized sound would be wherever I hear a sound source, I see a sound source, I hear it from there as well. Uh, externalization zero means I have in-head localization or very near to my head. And we just uh, take a number of test subjects and ask them to do that on some scale on one hand and especially then uh, do a mean value for all these test subjects. So perfectly externalized would be a one. You see, we can't do that either, at least not in this experiment. Uh, no externalization uh, is near the zero. KK is the dummy head. Um, then we got IN, that's uh, BRIRs done with actual measurements, so individualized HRTFs. And what's important is really if you look to the two right versions. There we got uh, what externalization we get in one room. If it's the same type of room for which the simulation has been done or the other type of room. In both cases, you see a statistical significant difference, very clearly significant. And you see the best uh, actual plausible reproduction you get in the seminar room with individualized HRDFs. But anyway, you get the statistical significant difference, so the effect is proven. Where does it come from? Again, it could be a visual influence. It could be personalization or remembering the room. From other experiments we've done, we say, okay, yes, there is some visual influence, which means all these systems will work better in a real virtual world compared to just uh, augmented reality or in the real world. But it's only a minor effect. Then, in fact, individual binaural synthesis helps quite a bit. And concrete room conditions help quite a bit as well. In fact, we seem to remember rooms and that helps with these effects. Okay, one more, adaptation. Again, just one example proving the basic idea. And again, here's a lot of details on the slide. We got the same rooms again here. What was you called HL in the last slide is here LL, listening lab and the seminar room. We get uh, as an anchor uh, just some mono reproduction. So there's no externalization, clearly. Then we got in the room where this testing was done, actual loudspeakers staying there. So that would be our APA anchor. That's the real system to compare to that's up there. 
And then we got the uh, extra oral headphones, which gives us easier externalization. And we trained people to listen to these effects in the different rooms. And in fact, after this not too long training, people putting them in the same and, or in a different room changed externalization drastically. So this time it was done with simulated. And of course, uh, you have different directions. And again, it's known if you are at 180 degree uh, externalization is worst. That's a front back confusion which can uh, occur. And to the sides, uh, it's best. That's what we see in both these uh, drawings. But apart from that, we see clearly on the right side the group which was trained in this listening lab, listening to uh, the simulated listening lab. Uh, really has the best effect. And if it's, uh, it's both was listening then in the seminar room for both. And again, it then works worse. So we got a training effect. One more without uh, figures, but just explaining the effects. Uh, what we've done as well, and that's the upcoming PhD thesis of Annika Neithardt, is that we uh, got quite some change in immersion, in realistic feeling if we walk really in the room. So tracked self-movement enhances immersion, supports really the auditory illusion. Orientation tracking, rotation, that's been known for a long time, reduces front back confusion and supports externalization. And translation, again, allows a better understanding of the scene, supports adaptation of the listener to the virtual room, and might, that's not fully clear, allow more accurate distance perception. Coming back to the time varying effects, uh, for what we heard before, that was really relatively short-term adjustment. But there are other effects which are really due to long-term training. And in fact, what happened a lot of research groups in this field is that somebody wanted to do it better and looked what can we do to do real good organization with headphones. And okay, people have done that, let's redo it, change something here, change something there do better HRTS, do better HRTFs. There have been too many PhD theses on HRTFs alone. And then suddenly said, okay, now I've done it, it works. Give the headphones to the colleague and the answer is no, that's the same as always. So what happened was this person, person did a long-term training on this for, its, for himself or herself. So that's really the long-term training. And that's a danger in all these systems, that if you do it yourself, you get trained. So the system seems to work. Then we got an adaptation to a new room. So which direct to reverberant ratio and others really corresponds to which distance? Externalization increases over time if you are in virtual rooms understanding of the scene helps. And there are a number of these effects, which by themselves are proven, but the exact interaction, the links between the effects are not yet known. So again, we have a number of cues, uh, but none can override really the others. So all of these can enhance the possibility for a convincing illusion, but monocausal explanations do not help. One dimensional optimization will not lead to success. So some more work which has been done in, okay, if we need information from the actual room, how do we do that? And we started out with putting a dummy head in the room 
room, let it rotate, uh, getting binary room impulse responses from different directions and use that for the rendering. But how to do it? So yes, you provide an acoustic transfer function for each position of a source listening res uh, relation. So you can do it with room acoustic simulations, which is not accurate enough. You still get acoustic divergence. You can do it with acoustic measurements, which means you have the correct room acoustics, but you need a lot of measurement all the time. So the idea was to use less measurement and doing extrapolation and interpolation measuring only a few positions. The question is how to do this, what, how to adjust the impulse responses. And there's been two uh, major steps of progress in that. Uh, one was the work by Simone Fug and others uh, shaping the uh, interval time delay gap. Uh, the gap between direct and early reflection and not into all uh, the okay sorry and use this to move the binary room impulse response to a new distance and the other one was combining that with energy adaption and weighting. So there are two approaches, use more measurements, interpolate or synthesis from one measurement. Again, that has been proven to be very successful. The question is how many measurements? And there's one experiment where we had 25 different measuring points. So a lot of time to measure three measurements or only one. And in fact, uh, we got still a lot of uh, differences between the different people. So it's not really clear that uh, this is completely accurate results, but uh, it seems on a level. So yes, we can reduce the number uh, of measurements and we can even reduce them to one. Uh, in fact, for externalization in the end with 95% confidence intervals, uh, these are overlapping. So that seems to be quite nice. Still, what to interpolate? How much work do we need to do for the interpolation? And again, there are different possibilities. There's a uniform so a way of putting our points where we move in the room and which get new interpolations. We could have a coarser or a finer selection of points and we can have non-uniform ways of doing it. So we have more points towards the sound source and less if we are far away. And again, uh, we've seen that there we can get away with quite some values. Uh, here are some examples. In fact, unfortunately, on different scales, we have a dense grid and a sparse grid. And the question was, people should work around and say, when, when is something happening which they don't like, which doesn't really fit uh, the wanted illusion there. And from that, we can say for music, uh, if we go to a more sparse grid, the quality degrades, uh, but it's not very fast. So we can do some compromise there. Okay, one more to look at is sound source directivity. So if we are moving in this virtual room, uh, we need, know of course that because of sound source directivity, there's an energy distribution into the room, which is frequency dependent. Uh, we look at that only for the direct sound parts, 
and modify the whole algorithm so that it takes into account the sound source directivity. And again, looking at that, looking at just noticeable differences, and let's see what is just uh, acceptable and what not, and so on. So that's uh, relatively new results, which have been presented uh, last year at the ACE convention in New York City. In fact, Ulrike Sloma and her co-authors got the Best Papers Award for that. And that, again, helps us to do the right thing, but with not too much uh, accuracy needed. So, speaking of testing these systems, in fact, let me introduce MPEG-I. MPEG, you know, the Moving Pictures Experts Group, now since a couple of years, is working on something called immersive MPEG-I for virtual and uh, augmented reality situations. The idea really is to do six, of six degrees of freedom. So that means you can walk around and you're in terms of audio, auditory perception and video, your feeling of the environment changes uh, if you are going around there. And this is done the MPEG way with a file format. In fact, that's mostly based on MPEG-H work. There's metadata to describe a scene. Uh, you need, of course, the full virtual scene with geometry, acoustical properties, interaction with objects, and so on. And the scenes are composed, not recorded, which means we don't have a ground truth, which means the testing is really difficult from the audio point of view. On the other hand, uh, MPEG will, at some point early next year, uh, call for proposals for such systems, and uh, it will evaluate them. And for that, tests need to be done. Okay, now, how to test these renderers and these systems if we don't have any ground truths available? So what's done in the moment is a lot of discussion on test methods and what figures of merit should be used. There will be a call for proposals. They will be evaluated. And then, in fact, the first selected candidate will, in a, a public process with everybody together, uh, iteratively be improved. That's the so-called core experiments. So what do we have in the test environment? It's in fact like this environment here that we have scenes where we can move. We have a tracking of position, pose of an evaluator, and the reproduction is then done with uh, either a VR display, in this case they use HTC Vives, or an augmented reality display that's done via uh, Microsoft HoloLens. And the audio rendering will be based on the proposals and there's plugins for Max MSP where everything should run. And that's then the complete architecture. So we got audio data with an MPEG H encoder PZM out, you got MPEG-I metadata encoding, bitstream file decoding, and you got different plugins. And uh, all the VR part is running on Unity. Okay, now how to test. People in MPEG for the last many years have successfully used MUSHRA, the multiple stimulus with hidden reference and anchors method. So that was the default to go on with MUSHRA as well. So there's a so-called MUSHRA VR, which tries to extend that to the virtual reality world with the problems that we don't have a reference. Then there's classic AB testing, and there's something new, which is called multi-attribute absolute category rating. So let's very shortly look into these, these possibilities. Mushra is very similar to 
the new recommendation method for subjective quality assessment uh, of audible differences of sound systems using multiple stimuli without a given reference, which means all the renderers have to play in parallel because you have to switch back and forth. The advantage is people have used that for a long time. The problems is for some things like if you're moving and so on, it's, it's difficult to do the comparison. Hyperrealism can influence the score and so on. AB testing again is well known, like BS1284-2 paired comparison. And you got two time aligned renderers and you can switch back and forth. And then you are asked on a comparison scale, which one sounds better or worse and so on. Problem is this model, which is used to create absolute scores from pairwise comparison is not always stable. And it can take a long time if you do all the possible combinations, all the pairs. And the third version is to do single attribute testing. Uh, so that's what people in speech uh, coding have been used or in speech processing for a long, long time. So you have different attributes like what's the overall quality, what's your sense of distance, uh, plausibility, and so on. You have three or four different categories and then you are asked after listening to each one to rate it. And if you do that with some repetition, you get statistically stable results in the end. Of course, what's good here, it only compares to the internal reference, the expected quality. You get detailed insights into the problems of renderers, but this is a new method and the scale might shift if it's, there's not sufficient training with the test subjects. Okay, just to give you the current status, there's test material, which has been too long, too complex. So they just doing work to reduce that. There's definition of short scenes already with clear tasks. There will be another pilot test uh, this fall. In fact, in September, it's not that long away. It will still use fake renderers. So we still don't have the full quality and we still have the problem that we don't know how things will behave in the real test. Okay, last chapter, let me tell you what some of our, our ideas for are, what all this could be used for. And that's, in fact, I've presented that two years ago already at AVAR. That's PARTY. I like this acronym. It's Personalized Auditory Reality. And yeah, probably this time we won't have the effect, but uh, assume you are on a social event at the conference, you want to talk to people, uh, but there's too much noise around you. You want to talk to somebody specifically on the same table, but still the others are talking. So, or you want to listen to the music and the people who talk they are not, that's not nice. Or you have some construction noise outside and you want, otherwise everything sounds perfect, but you want to have this construction noise go away. And uh, with that, the idea is that you can uh, lower noises, enhance what you want to listen to, and you can really, the system can recognize that and render it in a way, I always compare that to glasses. If you are wearing glasses, the world around you still looks normal. Uh, and sometimes so normal that you don't even realize you have your glasses still on uh, and you are looking for them. So this is, really an extended reality type of system. You want to freely modify the acoustic scene, enhance relevant sounds, suppress irrelevant sounds, add new ones. Okay, what do we have to do to make that work? We need a scene decomposition. So the system has to understand the scenes. We need source separation. 
which is something people have worked on for a long time, but it's still not a solved topic. We could do, we need directional sound field analysis like beam forming and recognition of sound objects. To do all that in real time is a challenge. We need source separation. Again, today we often get heavy artifacts. So we need deep learning, all this machine learning techniques in there. And how to do that within a few milliseconds because the whole system has to work in real time. Once you're using for that, you get some bleeding of the outside sound in there as well. So there shouldn't be a 150 milliseconds uh, delay. So it should be few, perhaps 10, 20 milliseconds. So, and then of course you have the scene recomposition and for that, you get the necessity to use the actual room you are in to render the audio in a way which matches the room and everything is perfectly plausible. And again, that's where all these other techniques come in. Okay, now I'm already at the end. Uh, so I hope for a long and good discussion with that. Uh, I just got two pictures from some demos we've already done. One was at the ICSA conference uh, in Ilmenau last year, when together with uh, Bayerischer Rundfunk, Werner Bleisteiner, we got content which was played in a room. We have here the 360 degree view and there was uh, some slides, some places where you could see text and then somebody was telling you and then there was surrounding noise from the scenes uh, which were described. And if you walked around, then the different places did speak to you and all that in a way that you really uh, didn't have the impression of sound within your head, but really that paper spoke to you and something was happening outside. So one more picture of that set up, uh, done with HTC uh, Vive tracking, in fact, no, different tracking system, sorry. Uh, with a tracking system, we have a professional tracking system and headphones, and that was basically it. To conclude, after, and that's, I know some people don't agree. They say, oh, it's all working perfectly. No, I don't think so. <laughs> After some 50 years of development, the task of possible binaural rendering of sound is still not solved. It works sometimes in some surroundings, uh, but there's nothing yet where we can say, okay, problem solved for audio. There have been many ideas. There is an active research community. And of course, many of these people are here and will be at AVAR next week. Just to remember, simple optimization methods do not work. And again, I've seen too often, even from well-respected colleagues, which I well respect as well, the sentence, okay, we just have to find the right HRTFs and HRTF interpolation and then everything works. No, unfortunately not. Our brain is not LTI, near linear, nor time invariant. So we have to look into all these expectation things. We have to take to account the room we are actually in and so on and so on. There is a big influence in cognition in a way we do not yet fully understand. We got much better understanding now than 10 years ago, but we can't say it's fully understood. And for the good news part of these conclusions, if I sounded, did sound too negative, there has been tremendous progress in the past 10 years. And yes, I believe at some point we will finally get fully plausible sound reproduction via headphones. And that's basically it. And I'm looking forward to a good discussion now.
Thank you so much, uh, Carl Heinz. I th All right, I everyone. Think the audience um, so you should see a raise hand button on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please press that button, and I'll call on you in the order that the questions were asked. So, Aaron Berkson. Hello. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me okay. Um, a question about psychoacoustics and um, creating plausible audio. What's your perspective on different types of audio in terms of psychoacoustic um, level of uh, convincingness, if that's a word, um, specifically kind of dialogue versus music versus sound effects or you know, figurative versus uh, kind of conceptual sounds that you're exposed to? Has that been? Um, looked into or thought about? Um, I'm not aware of any formal uh, work on that. But yes, we did use different types of sounds all the time. And in fact, that's uh, some problem in psychoacoustics that uh, over and over again, people just use very simple sounds to find the effects and don't look at the others. So we are working with speech and uh, we try to reproduce complex sounds as well. Um, the basic problems, as long as my experience goes, is similar with all these. So there's no real difference. Of course, with the exception of just some very simple sounds, it's known if you have a sine wave, there's not much cues to your brain where the sine wave comes from. Uh, so uh, if there's effects uh, which uh, have uh, quite some activity in time, uh, like clicks and so on, that helps you, in fact, helps people blind people to recognize the environment and to help you to get a better sense of the room as well. So this has been tested. Cool, thank you. All right, any other questions? I don't see any other hands raised right now. As a reminder, the button is on the right hand side of your screen. No more. I expected more questions, I have to say. <laughs> let, let me also interject um, that after the question and answer session, we will head over to Avar Lobby. And we are, uh, anyone is welcome to join us there uh, just for an informal discussion. And I believe Carl Heinz will join us All right. as well, uh, if, it's not, if it's not too late Brian for him. Katz. Go ahead. Um, so I'm interested, what are your kind of future projects, the next couple experiments that you have in mind? Did that work? Oh. So Yes, of course. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, the question was what are our next experiments we are planning to do? <laughs> In fact, I, I would have to look at the list of uh, master theses which are currently uh, undergoing. <laughs> I don't remember all these. There's a lot of little details in this area which still need more looking at. Um, we, we are far from done, uh, like what can we do it for more complex situations? Uh, one big question is how can we simplify the setup of such a system in the moment we do these BRIR measurements and we set up such a system at a different university and it was one day of measuring and setting up the system. Of course, in the end, it should be something which goes automatically and instantly. So the question is, how can we go on with different ways to get these measurements? 
that's in fact something we work on at Plantenburg Labs as well in the moment to simplify the setup and so on. And but then if you're if you're focusing on on BRIRs, then you're you're fixing the HR gap, right? You're not allowing any kind of individualization on that aspect, or or did I miss something? Oh no, that's that that's still that uh, the. Uh, individualized HRTFs help a lot, that's been known. In fact, it was uh, for me quite unexpected that in the moment the system works quite well, not fully good quality, but quite well in with non-individualized HRTFs. But that, uh, in fact, it's known that others are working on that as well. There are different ways to try to do fast measurements, to do approximations of HRTS and so on. And that would be something we would uh, at least f- test as well. And I assume if we find a good low complexity way to do that, it would help the system as well. Have you, have you compared, for example, which is more important between an individual HRTF and, and an unmatched room? I mean, have you, have you done kind of the, the room acoustics versus the HRTF quality comparison. Um, um, it's that you're, that you're yes. choosing to kind of eliminate the HRTF and you're putting all your work onto 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 the room effect when we know that the HRTF uh, is a key point. <clears throat> no, we, 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 I didn't mention these, but of course we looked into the HRTFs as well. And it's it's known, I just say it has been There's been some overestimation, like it will solve everything. And from our point of view, no, it doesn't. Sure, sure. And probably we will have the right combination of both in the end. That's really what I will think we we will end up with. In the moment, we can get uh, nice demos even without individualized HRTFs, but we know how much they help. In fact, we even did the different types of measurements. There's been a long discussion whether it's okay to measure at the entrance of the ear canal or at the ear drum. We've done both as well. Okay, thanks. All right, any other questions? Dustin, can you hear me? I can, yep. Yes, good. I, I don't know if I was on air before. Um, but I just wanted to say that after the question and answer uh, session, we will be going over to Avar Lobby for an informal discussion. And um, I hope that Carl Hanks will join us if it's not too late for him. Sure, no, no. <laughs> for a few minutes. Yeah. We, are, we are still 45 minutes away from the 9 p.m. here noon your site uh, deadline right. in time. Great. Yeah, and so go ahead and, and Dustin, see if there are any more questions and we can wrap up um, with the question and answer. All right, cool. Yeah, uh, any, anyone have any last questions before we go over to the AVAR lobby? All right, doesn't look like it. Let's show another round of um, virtual applause for for Carl Heinz, and thank you so much uh, for a very inspiring talk. And uh, we'll see you all in a few minutes over in Avar Lobby. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.